Well, I'll start with the mistakes. It's much easier for me to talk about because it's such a long list. I came in with not a tremendous amount of understanding of systemic wellness. And for some reason, we decided that the place to start would be with the nutrition policy. We almost made a video of us coming in a, in a police car and banging a, a tray of cupcakes out of a poor parent's hand. So if I could recommend the last place to start in wellness, it might be a, a prescriptive nutrition policy where you write the document first. So everything I just said there is wrong. Every piece of it is wrong, but we did it all. Um, and and you, it's about the data thing. Okay, we messed this up. Let's stop, let's look at why, and let's see how we can do better in the, in the future. It seems lately that there's been a bit of a trend to downplay the significance of educational conferences. I understand why it can be expensive and oftentimes one-off kind of experiences don't seem to have the impact that perhaps the investment would warrant. That said, as somebody who's attended a lot of conferences over the years, I'm still a big fan largely because I am typically introduced to people that I just can connect with and resonate with and learn from in perhaps, otherwise maybe I wouldn't do that. So that was the case last year, I attended a conference in Edmonton on workplace wellness and was introduced to the work of Paul Corrigan an Elk Island Catholic, specifically their work around workplace wellness. And what impressed me most from the onset was Paul's willingness to say right up front, we have made a lot of mistakes and was able to share those mistakes and, and yet, you know, stayed the course and persevered and they continue to have success. And they, this is not something that's a bandwagon thing that began after COVID. This is something that they have been working on as a district for years now. And so while they still do not claim they have figured it all out, they're doing some really, really interesting work around there. And so it was exciting to be able to have Paul on the show and share a little bit about that and some of the other things that he sees around leadership, some interesting things he shared with me and that you'll get to hear. So please enjoy my conversation with Paul Corrigan, superintendent of Elk Island Catholic Schools. So Paul, we're talking today, it's, it's the fall of 2023. Many of the superintendents and leaders that I've talked to over the while talk about this opening of school years being just that much uh, better in terms of not having to deal with, with the immediate and the lingering effects of COVID. That said, you and I talked a little bit about the impact of COVID and and there was all this optimism about the silver linings of COVID, which I didn't really see in a lot of districts. But I think you guys, you guys really do see some of the silver linings and things that you've carried through from COVID. Can you just talk a little bit about what those are? Yeah, absolutely. I, first, I'd agree with the assessment. Like, it's exciting to come back post-COVID, and it really feels like post-COVID this year. Uh, but at the same time, we're, do we're doing everything that we did beforehand in addition to. So sometimes... Did we learn any lessons? A couple of practices that for us have been helpful that we've stuck with is one is the staggered entry. So it, it, it was absolutely necessi uh, necessary during COVID, but almost of our 18 schools, 16 of our schools did a staggered entry this year, all but our big high schools, um, where they just come over two days and it just allows the kids a chance to get to know the teacher in a smaller class setting and, and feel comfortable and have a little, the teacher, they love it. They have a little time to be able to get to know the kids um, without the pressure. So uh, I feel like we'll continue to do that moving forward. Um, it's been a good practice for us. And the second silver lining, because you're right, it, it is kind of a struggle to find those silver linings, frankly, but was has been a sense of, it's not a hero's, it's, you're not the hero if you drag yourself into work when you're coughing and wheezing and sick and, and you stay home, and, you know, for students, and staff, like it, the world will not end. Uh, we had, we, we were forced to be home, all of us at various times, even when schools was, were in and it, it was okay. And I, I think that's, it's a better practice for us to get used to as a culture shift. So it took a lot to get there. Well, I don't know, I don't know your situation. Again, a lot of people that I talk with are struggling with like substitute teachers, teachers on call, whatever, whatever they're called in your jurisdiction, but. How have you been able to sort of maintain that posture, that stance, even in the light of 
not not always that easy to find somebody to come in. Yeah, and our, our board particularly has we we have all the experiences. So in suburban Sherwood Park, we, that's kind of a place of choice for living, and so we usually have a number of subs there. But we have rural communities as well, Vegerville and Camrose. And again, it, it especially during COVID when people had to be out, it was how can we work things differently to make this work without in, without a sub or two or three teachers for sure, and on the casual on the EA side even more so. It really really struggled with casual uh, support staff. But it is, it's, it is to your point, the rethinking of everything. We, we, we can't maintain exactly the way we did it before. And, and I don't know that we've, you know, finalized how we're going to approach it, but it's this, it's, the, it's the idea of maintaining a posture that says, if you need to stay home, we want you to stay home. We want you to be well. And that wellness is really, you know, one of the reasons why I really wanted to talk with you today, Paul, because I know that, Elk Island Catholic has uh, been really at the at the fore of what it means of of your well being journey, and and I got to hear you and your colleague present back in November of 2022 at the um, workplace well being event, and was just so impressed with your journey and and all the things you've done there and and particularly i, I you know and we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about wellness as we go on but but first the, the the thing that you shared was this idea of assurance dashboard which first of all that word assurance is a very i know that's a very intentional choice and i've i've actually written about on my blog about sort of accountability having a lot of negative connotations for for a lot of reasons and Teachers don't like it. School districts don't like it because it, it it has a little bit of a, you know, a negative idea that let me find all the things you're not doing and you need to be accountable for. It. And you you call this assurance dashboard. And can you just talk a little bit about what an assurance dashboard is, what the impact has been in and and in your division, both internally and externally? Yeah, absolutely. We've been on the assurance kind of journey for maybe seven or eight years now, as, as have a number of boards throughout the province of Alberta. But taking this idea, and you're exactly right, flipping it on its head of you know, accountability is always up, it feels like, and assurance we believe is down. So, so you, you want to give assurance to the parents and your community of the things that you're able, you're doing in your schools. So we modeled our division after four assurance areas or three assurance areas, I should say, to start with. And we added wellness. So we can come back to that as, as once it became one of our assurance goals, that was a, that was a sea change for the organization because it allowed, it embedded the ability for us to hang everything we're doing now on that assurance model. But in, so with all our assurance goals, we have a, a dashboard that is a live facing dashboard to the public, to anybody that shows how we're doing in each of those areas. And so it, it feeds in a number of data sources, surveys, but then also even things from our staff, uh, PD days and our budget uh, into, the, into the website that live changes the results on how we're doing in each of the areas. So you can take each of the four areas, you dig down and you can see how we're doing year, year over year in each of the objectives that we have as a division. Um, and it has been a huge culture shift and it, and I won't lie, it's taken a long time, um, and a lot of coming back to it and a lot of people understanding that, yeah, we're moving forward with this, but I think we've gotten to a pretty good part place where assurances is, is the language we're all using and our community is aware of it as well. Yeah. And if we're the, I think we're the first, the one thing we did last year is because our departments now have assurance plans as well. It's not just schools. It's not just teachers. Each teacher does this, their own individual plan. The schools do a plan. Our departments do a plan. And for the first time ever last year, our board of trustees did their own plan as well. So I think that might be the first group to ever do that. But it shows that the whole division is about assurance now. We've moved to that place. Yeah, I mean, that's fantastic. I, 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 can't, I can't even think of anywhere else where people are willing to be that vulnerable with their learning and growth. Is there anything on that board over the sort of year over year thing that maybe might be seen initially as, oh, that's not very good. Like we're, we're, we're slipping in this area. And if so, what, what's the response around that one, around any kind of downturn, which there has to be, right? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And 
one of the big cultural pieces when putting this data public facing was conversation with a leadership first and then staff about data's data. It's, it's not a reflection of you. It's not an indication of even the work you're doing. We don't know everything that goes into changing things. So if there's a downturn, it's, our, it is our job to respond to it, but, but we don't have to feel like it's a reflection on our, the personal work we're doing. And th that's been a hard piece, but it's one of the first cultural things that needs to happen. Otherwise you're sunk before you begin, frankly. So do you, is that something that is, you know, regularly shared at, you know, principals meetings or like, is it, is it sort of the, sort of the go-to place of where conversations begin? It, it absolutely is. So every year when the new survey data comes in and, and, and we're doing kind of a big change to the, to the website, we, we speak with, we spend a full day with our leadership going through the numbers. So they, they do see some of the numbers ahead of time to say, okay, how are we going to engage this? And then. The conversation isn't that a number has went down. The conversation is, why did it go down? What's the story? And how can we engage with our stakeholders at making it better? And that's, that's such a, I think that's the, mm -hmm. a rich conversation. Why, why, is, why is this happening? What's going on here? And again, not to immediately jump in <clears throat> to blame or, or even to solutions, but just to really understand context. Because, you know, that as much as data is important, Education is a human endeavor. We deal with human beings all the time and they're complex and they're, they're, they're not always as linear. Things don't always go as linear as they might in other, in other industries. And, and to tie it together, I, I, I believe that we've had more success since we have had a focus on wellness and connection and trust. Because if you don't have trust in the organization, then all of this goes out the window because pe people are looking to point fingers and blame rather than Let's get to the bottom of the story so that we can help kids. Yeah. And so let's talk a little bit specifically about the wellness journey that, that you've been on. Again, I, I, I think when, when I heard you share, you, you were very honest by saying, boy, you made a lot of mistakes and you identified them and you grew from them. So when you think about that journey, can you just talk a little bit about maybe some of those lessons you learned and, and as you think about where you are in 2023, what are you, what are you most proud of? Sure. Yeah. Well, I'll start with the mistakes. It's much easier for me to talk about because it's such a long list. The, you know, we came in, I came in with not a tremendous amount of understanding of systemic wellness. And for some reason, we decided that the place to start would be with the nutrition policy and, and we need to, and so there really, we almost made a video of us coming in a, in a police car and banging a, a tray of cupcakes out of a poor parent's hand. So it, if I could recommend the last place to start and well, this, it might be a, a prescriptive nutrition policy where you write the document first. So everything I just said there is wrong. Every piece of it is wrong, but we did it all. Um, and, and you, it's about the data thing. Okay. We messed this up. Let's stop. Let's look at why, and let's see how we could do better in the, in the future. And so a turning point early on for us was, as I said, getting wellness into the assurance as one of our four goals in the division which allowed us to kind of make some of the moves from just one off. This is a great idea to, this is an embedded practice. And it was the vehicle by which you can speak to principals about what are your wellness goals and how are you going to measure them? And how is this going to look on our dashboard? And so, so maybe a principal where wellness wasn't their number one priority. Well, yeah, but it's going to have to be a part of your plan. It's going to be, have to be a part of the things you do and taking this idea of wellness and making it everybody's responsibility. Um, so in terms of perhaps the thing I'm most proud of in terms of where we've came to in the last, whatever, seven, eight years is that the idea of connection and relationship and wellness as an essential precondition to teaching and learning is really something that I think this school division believes in. Those pieces are not extras. They're not add-ons. They're, they're preconditions to effective teaching and learning. Oh God. So it has not been through any, any great work of I've done, but just amazing people around here and a dedication to continue to go back to it when we've messed up. So can you point to any specific actions or strategies that speak to that idea of, of 
preparedness and, and people being having that foundation before they engage in teaching and learning? Is there any is there any kind of examples that you can think of or strategies that you employ that 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 help that? Yeah, it it modeling like it it has to be modeled for your staff first and foremost. So some of the things you know we we've had ups and downs and difficult budgetary times, but but pieces like staff retreats or leadership retreats are non-negotiables because it is the they're the bedrock of relationship that then under undergirds everything else that you do. Right, and so you, you have to support it by showing that you're doing it. So it has to be part of your PL time. You have to listen to staff because it gets muddy when, when you say wellness is a priority, staff have things to say to you about that. You've created a trusting environment and now you got to deal with the stuff that, that maybe has been under the surface and that's not easy, but you have to have a patience to work through it. If you shut that down, then, then you might as well have not started the process at all. And then resources, you, you can't, you can't say this is important and then not resource it because Show me your budget and I'll, and I'll show you your priorities. I'm trying something a little different today, something called a mid-roll. And I hadn't done this before, but I thought I'd give it a try. So this is the sort of short, brief commercial break that you'll hear in between my podcast. So this episode is brought to you by Advanced Learning Partnerships, also known as ALP. We are a professional learning consulting group that serves communities across North America. We are partners, designers, and agents for change. And you can learn more about the work we do at alplearn.com. And now back to my conversation with Paul Corrigan. And as you sort of reference leadership there, I think about, about what, you're, what you've learned about leadership and specifically your division's leaders, because again, you've got some data, I think that reflects potentially, at least when you shared that with me, is like, I was kind of, I was kind of taken aback when you shared that. What, what can you say about wellness and leadership? Yeah. One of the things that has came out from our dashboard data, from our data is you look at the subgroups of staff and as you move up from teachers, say to vice principals, quote unquote up, I should say, but to, to a leadership position, vice principals, their wellness data is lower than teachers as a group. And the, the least, the lowest wellness data, especially in terms of relationships it, are our principals in, in the division. And so so again, as you mentioned before, this is not great data. Like it doesn't make us feel good or look good, uh, but you have to deal with it. And so then what, what are we doing to create support networks for principals who are navigating changing relationships in their own school and often feel isolated and alone? The data is clear for us. It's in front of us. And now we have an obligation to try as a system to figure out what to do with it. So what are some of the ways you might help solve yeah. that? It, it, for us, it has been embedded collaboration time within our admin meetings to make, you know, we change up the seating arrangements and we allow for engagement time in, in the meetings, going through a topic and then saying, okay, now talk to your neighbor about it and where are they at and where are you at? Doing, doing the retreats, occasionally we'll take just the principals for a retreat. And then every year we do a leadership retreat overnight with all of us together. It, the, the, the expressed goal is to create those those cross school relationships with each other. And then just uh, taking an opportunity to have fun. Um, at the end of the year, last year, our leaders, we took our leadership team to an old 1980s, 90s style arcade, you know, where we had a big pinball tournament and it was a great time to be able to just take an opportunity to connect. And, you know, people say, well, you just, that's just having fun. That's not really part of the business. Well, it is. And it has an impact right. on the data and it has an impact on our education system. And we can, and we well, can. And I think, I, yeah. And I think what the, the, having that data as part of the assurance thing can help directly align that budget with, yeah, doing this fun thing is in service of building relationships, which is in service of supporting our leaders who then are supporting, like it, it trickles down. And, and I, you know, I know in, in my work, you know, I talk a lot about joy and, and it's funny when I, when I've talked about that with, with educators, sometimes, you know, I'll give a talk and they'll come to me and they'll say, I really appreciate that. Cause I, and they, they're almost like whispering to me, I do this really kind of fun thing with my, with my kids, but I don't want other people to know about it. Cause it doesn't look academic. And I'm trying to tell them like, no, 
you don't need to hide. I don't think you need to hide that. I, I feel bad for you if you have a principal who's going to give you a hard time about that. But, but that is, that's how you build community. That's how you build connection. And that's when learning happens. And I, I guess what I, as I'm rambling on here, Paul, I'm wondering if all of this that we've talked about here has trickled down to parents to maybe help them shift some of the way they think about school and, and are, are they beginning to see, oh, I'm glad you're taking these principles on retreat and, and creating community supports for them because I know in the end, this is going to benefit my child because that's where my kid wants to go to school. I, one of my favorite quotes is, Adults need to have fun so children will want to grow up. How do we create, how do we create an environment that kids say, I want to be like Mr. Corrigan. I want to be like, because look at how much fun they have at work. So I, I don't know if, 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 you, if you've been able to sort of sense a shift in parents or support around the idea that investing it in this, these ways is very, very critical to the success of their child. Yeah. Well, okay. Oh, there's a lot there on the joy thing. I'll just say just like, you know, we have a division theme every year. It's a faith theme for us as a Catholic school division. And two years ago, our theme was choose joy because, because that was exactly what we saw was necessary at the, it was kind of in the black period of COVID. Right. And this idea of it's a choice and you have to go there anyway, that's a different podcast, I suppose. But, uh, um, in terms of parental engagement, that's a key piece for us. And the idea is that we're spending resources to create the environment that we also want in the classrooms for your children. So if we don't model that with leadership and if model leadership doesn't model it with staff, it won't happen for kids. And it's student and staff wellness. We're all one. Yep. It's a Absolutely. limited success. I, I certainly am not going to say all of our parents are ecstatic about every time there's, there's these, these different activities, um, especially when they have to, you know, it's PD days and you have to look for childcare, but, but in we do collect the data specifically from parents and they seem overarching and very pleased with the wellness initiatives we have which are always full community based yeah if and not sometimes staff based frankly well and you know i don't think this this is a, this is a shift right this is not something that parents and taxpayers have seen as a priority and so but i think you guys are ahead of the game in the fact that you been doing this for a while. You've now included in it as part of your uh, assurance dashboard. I think I think others can learn a lot from where you are and knowing that yeah, you, have, you haven't solved <laughs> you haven't solved all the problems yet. But but I think you I I think the pathway that you've chosen puts you continues to help you. I think is going to help you grow. So all I, all I can say is thank you so much for for leading the way in this and and continuing to. To stand by this, even though, you know, it might be easier just not to have people know what you're doing. Because <laughs> there's, there's a lot of websites, I'll tell you, I go on it and, and it's hard to find strategic plans. It's hard to find anything because it's like, ah, we don't really want to have everybody in our business if we can help it. Well, I, will, I will say once you go down the road, it's pretty hard to go back. I, I don't know if I, how I could think of a reason to go back at this point. And no. frankly, nor would I want you. Yeah, no, the ship sailed, but it's great. Anyways, thank you so much, Paul. I want to ask you a few other outside the school day, but maybe I think this is actually attached to the wellness conversation too. So I'll, I'll make that segue. What have you been reading or listening to lately that's uh, piqued your interest? Yeah, okay, happy to, happy to share. My summer reading, which I just finished, was I'm a big fan of detective stories. But the problem with the great detective stories is there are only so many of them. So there's no more Sherlock Holmes, but there's a lot of fan fiction. And two of my favorite detectives are Sherlock Holmes and a guy by the name of Father Brown, a little less known figure, but oh, he's been, there's been a TV show lately. Yeah. The fan fiction book off Kickstarter that combined, it's called the, the clergyman and the detective. And it combined the two of them and, and created some fan fiction stories. And I, th I thought that was amazing. And just, just a way to keep these stories going. The podcast uh, that, that has my attention these days is by a guy by the name of Arthur Brooks. Um, and I would highly recommend it. I really would. Other, other than this podcast, of course, but uh, <laughs> that's right. Um, yeah. The, it, he talks about how to properly disagree with each other. He, he's an American and, and he, he would, I guess, be call himself a conservative, but his parents were, parents are 
professors in Seattle. And so they're, they're very much liberals. And so he grew up in this environment where that was okay. And now since 2016, he's seen this dichotomous world in the U.S. where liberals and conservatives hate each other. And, and he's saying, how can we disagree with each other without, without being angry? And, and what is the art of disagreement and getting over this polarization idea? I, I've really enjoyed that. Yeah. Okay. Well, that one's going to be on my list because that is, that is a topic that I think about, talk about, try to wrap my head around all the time. So I remember hearing, there was a podcast a while back called, I think it was called The Atheist and the Christian. They were best friends. And they just talked about their differences of, of how they view the world, right? As, as polar opposites in terms of worldview, but friends nonetheless, and could figure out how to have this conversation in a way that, that respected both parties. So yeah, and, and this, that's something I, I would say, it, it may be the key for us as schools to help our children figure out how to live in a world where not everybody thinks the same. And that's, Absolutely that's essential. critical. And yeah, and it, it's like, once again, it's maybe kids who do it better than us right now is the reality of it. As that I said, that's a wonder, but yeah, just re relearning that. So I've really enjoyed that. Uh, he's done a lot of research. It's research-based. Uh, yeah, the Arthur Brooks show. And then I, I watch a lot of Star Wars. I'm, I'm loving all the Star Wars pieces now, Andor and Ahsoka. Some time with the kids on that. If, if you're a Star Wars fan, come back because those mini series are great. <laughs> All right. Well, that's, that's a good one. Now, whether you want to talk about the Sherwood Park area or at Edmonton at large, I always am curious about people to share a hidden gem. Uh, maybe it's a, a local place, could be a restaurant, could be a park, could be an activity or something that might not be evident on there. You know, when they first come and grab the tourism flyer, when they land at the airport or drive through the city, but what's some of your favorite hidden gems? Oh, sure. Thank you. I, I'm going to mention it because I mentioned it. it. It's it's three blocks from our office here in Sherwood Park. It's called Arcadium, and it's that retro arcade. If you want a fun night, um, especially if you're in the say 35 plus bracket, um, to relive your childhood, you pay fifteen dollars. You get to play all the video games you watch from your childhood. Um, I had many a misspent lunch hour in the arcade when I was in high school, so I got to relive that. Uh, it's called Arcadium. We have a neat, neat place that you might not see, and then. Uh, I live in Fort Saskatchewan, just outside Edmonton, and there's a beautiful restaurant there run by a local couple who's, who have a beautiful backstory and they, they give so much back to the community that if I ever have an opportunity like this, it's called The Venue by Kent's Catering, locally owned, and they locally feed the poor of the community, or, or sorry, regularly feed the poor of the community all the time. So it's a, it's. A little, little higher in dining, but if you ever have an opportunity to drive out to Fort Saskatchewan, beautiful place. That sounds fantastic. Both of those would be great activities. Maybe maybe a night, maybe you do the arcade stuff first and you go oh, for dinner I, after. Yeah, exactly. Is that it? Yeah. Great yeah. date. Hey, Paul, thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. Again, admire your work and all the best in Elgato Catholic and with your Star Wars journeys as, as well. <laughs> thank you for that. I appreciate it. Don't worry. 